Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, today I will be talking on uh, neonatal resuscitation, uh, what's new. And um, let me share with you the slides. So, uh, when we are talking about uh, new guidelines which came up in 2020, I would like to highlight the fact that from where these guidelines begin. So, there are multiple people who are responsible to uh, bring these guidelines to us, American Heart Association, Inter-American Heart Foundation, European Resuscitation Council, and uh, and all those, all these people come together. Uh, the Australian New Zealand Committee on Resuscitation, Asian Committee on Resuscitation, and then they form the guidelines. And uh, the ILCOR task forces, what they include, they include three types of evidences uh, to set the guidelines. Uh, one is evidence update, the other is scoping review, and the third is a systematic review. Now, uh, the latest guideline, the first which came, were in circulation in October 2020, and they were online only, and then they were published later. So what they included from 2015, when the last guidelines were there, after that, from 2016 to 2020, they have included three scoping reviews, which uh, include effect of briefing and debriefing and deliveries, suctioning the clear feed, positive pressure ventilation devices. There were 12 evidences updates which were taken, which included prediction of need of respiratory support in the delivery room, initial steps of resuscitation, positive end expiratory pressure versus no PEEP, CPAP versus intermittent positive pressure ventilation, CPR ratios and techniques, use of volume infusion and bicarbonate during resuscitation, and post-resuscitation care. The seven systematic reviews included intubation and suctioning of a non-vigorous peconium stained infant, sustained inflation, oxygen use in term in preterms, epinephrine uh, in resuscitation, use of interosseous lines, impact of duration and intensive resuscitation. So they came up with this uh, flow chart, which all of us are going to use. And the other things which were all included in this is physiology of asphyxia uh, is talked about, therapeutic hypothermia, pod management, heart rate is suspended, chest compression, epinephrine, meconium strain, amniotic fluid, baby's room versus oxygen air devices to be used on ventilation, and uh, targeted saturation with titrated FiO2. And some of them were including uh, official NRP in core new studies, and some are my personal opinions. Now, I will start with what was new in this mm -hmm. and then we can go to the algorithm which is used so they talked about renewal to maintain the skills and uh, we all know that one should renew every two years but we all also are aware of the fact that uh, most of us are forgetting um, our skills and uh, two years is a big period and hence it is recommended that more frequent sessions in the unit to be done to maintain the skills and that should be done every three to six monthly. Then is the anticipation of resuscitation need. Every birth should be attended by one end person who should be trained for NRP and who should know how to give positive pressure ventilation. And this person should be responsible only and only for the baby and not for the mom. Then the cord clamping. So if you look at the different evidences, it did show that if you caught the clamp late, which may vary from 60 seconds to four to five minutes, uh, 22 RCTs were included, 3,733 newborns were taken. And for preterms, when they looked at data, 
for less than one month, they found that delayed cord clamping did improve the transitional circulation. There was less need for trans blood transfusion, neck and IVH. And after one month also, there was an effect on increased hematocrit and ferritin. For the term baby, also, there was a lower anemia and improved iron stores. What about the babies who cannot be uh, done uh, delayed cord clamping? Can you do uh, umbilical cord milking? So for term babies, we have a lot of evidence that you can do the umbilical cord milking and it has got a beneficial effect. But for preterm babies, uh, initially it came up that because you are providing hematopoietic stem cells, mesenchymal stoma cells, and um, hence uh, it actually would reduce the ROP requiring surgery when you do a cord milking, and that too in baby between 23 to 27 weeks. 52 versus 72% was the ROP required in surgery rate, which is good enough. However, soon after that, there was a study which was actually abundant uh, early on because of the bad effects which the cord milking had that was increased at an IVH. And the reason for that is when uterine contractions are ha happening and you're milking the cord, the blood from the umbilical vein, instead of going to the uh, pulmonary side because of the poor respiratory efforts and increased PVR would go to the left ventricular preload and hence will go directly to the carotid flow. From the umbilical artery also, because the increase uh, pulmonary artery is not, uh, is still constricted and uh, pulmonary pressures are still higher. So the blood is going to go to the descending aorta and from there it will go to the carotid flow and both of them will cause increase in IVH. And hence you cannot do a cord milking in a preterm baby. Now, the timing of the delayed cord clamping is not yet very well defined. The studies, whatever we have, shows no difference. So whether they compare 30 to 60 seconds, 20 to 120 seconds, or 60 to 3 to 5 minutes, they showed no difference. And we are waiting for the results of the uh, other studies, which are going to uh, give us exact timing when we should do a delayed cord clamping. So there are multiple studies which are still going on and uh, they are looking at different outcomes and uh, we will be getting some report and I think in 2025 we will know better. Now when you want to do a resuscitation with intact cord, the problems which we face is uh, because we have a very short cord so we have to be very near to the mom's bed Maintaining the sterility is an issue, inadequate access to the personnel because the mother, uh, the doctors and anesthetists are all around. Difficulty in temperature maintenance and monitoring is also a problem. And hence different uh, resuscitation trolleys were, uh, had come up. And recently in UAE, we have this trolley to our uh, health. And I'm sure this is going to improve our outcomes. Now, before the birth, there were four pre, uh, questions which were there early in 2015, gestational age, amniotic fluid clear or not, additional risk factors. And the fourth question were how many babies, which is taken away now. And instead of that comes umbilical cord management. Then the next thing which has come up as a big way is oxygen in the delivery room. And there were systematic reviews uh, on initial oxygen concentration in term and preterm neonatal resuscitation, which came in pediatric 2019. And uh, in a preterm babies that is less than 35 weeks, when they compared the lower initial oxygen to the higher initial oxygen, and they looked into the short term mortality and a long term mortality, neurodevelopmental impairment, ROP, neck, BPD, major IVH, and time to reach. reach heart rate more than 100 beats per minute. There were two studies after in 2015. Uh, one was by Ravi et al. and the other one was Oil Gel et al. Both of them showed a absolutely opposite result where Ravi showed that the lower oxygen was beneficial whereas Oil Gel et al. showed that 
higher oxygen was beneficial. And uh, then came the systematic review, which combined all these studies, and they found that if the risk of bias is less, the higher um, the lower oxygen is beneficial. If the risk of bias is higher, then higher FiO2 is beneficial. And if you combine both of them, it's no difference in mortality. And same is no difference in the uh, need of mechanical ventilation. And uh, what you can see that if you uh, look at the initial oxygen concentration for preterms, uh, the 95 confidence interval should be seen for potential harm or benefit. And um, one of the study which uh, looked into uh, long-term mortality, one to three years, uh, sorry, two studies, they showed that there was a benefit in the lower FIO2 group. And hence, what is the optimal option in the delivery room by Elcor is that they suggested that a lower oxygen concentration of 21 to 30 percent is still better than 60 to 100 percent in babies who are less than 35 weeks. And you should subsequently titrate the oxygen concentration looking at the pulse oximeter uh, and looking at the saturations. So it is different for different gestation. More than 31 weeks air, 28 to 31 weeks air or 30 percent oxygen. Less than 28, 30 percent oxygen straight away. And I think it may come for 23, 24 weeker, higher FiO2 will come up. At five minutes, you should look at saturations more than 80% and heart rate more than 100. So if these are not achieved, these babies may be at risk of deaths early on. This is very important. And for a baby, uh, preterm baby, there are, with all these evidences, there are still gaps in the knowledge because we should have more RCTs to look at the uh, neurodevelopmental outcome. And for specific gestation, different uh, um, RCT should be performed. And the oxygen target should be seen at different gestation differently. And how best we are titrating the oxygen in the delivery room is also a matter of concern. And when now we are delaying the cord clamping, is it impacting the oxygen uh, use following the birth? Too much of oxygen, we should always be uh, aware that it is going to cause blindness. In the babies who are more than 35 weeks, very clear, 21% oxygen should be used. 100% oxygen is in, uh, uh, causing more and more of mortality, so should not be done. And then uh, we should have this chart where uh, we should see if our saturations which are targeted at five minutes are achieved or not. And if they are not achieved, then we should be increasing our FiO to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 every 30 seconds. Then the heart rate monitoring. Now we all know that uh, earlier we used to uh, monitor the heart by just uh, touching the caudal stamp and looking at the throbs in which we can feel in our fingers. And then we move to the auscultation through the stethoscope. And then when we compared both these methods, we found that pulse oximeter was better. And then came the ECG. And when we compared the ECG to pulse oximeter, we found that uh, ECG is uh, um, picking up the heart rate much earlier than the uh, pulse oximeter in the first two minutes. However, if you look at the long-term uh, other clinical outcomes like time to positive pressure ventilation, need of intubation, change in FiO2, increase in PIP, then there were not much difference between pulse oximeter and the ECG. So the, if any baby who is requiring resuscitation, we must put a ECG, that must be done. Then the chest compression. Uh, uh, these are the studies with the piglets. And I, why I want to highlight that something is coming up. Like if you combine, if you need to give a chest compression, you can combine them with sustained inflation. And um, then they achieved a better uh, tidal volume and, and one small study was done uh, from this piglet to the newborns and it found that the um, ROSC was achieved much earlier if you did with sustained inflation. However, we don't have uh, more data, so we cannot talk about it uh, much. And uh, uh, as such, if you talk about the sustained inflation, we know that uh, uh, it's no more uh, 
and recommended. A systematic review came up for sustained inflation where they compared sustained inflation without sustained inflation and they looked at death before discharge, death in the delivery room, air leaks, need for mechanical ventilation, BPD, severe IVH, etc. And uh, after 2015, there were nine more RCTs which were available and they found that the death before discharge from hospital were more if you do a sustained inflation. A sale trial came which had to be abundant early on because of more deaths in the sustained inflation. And hence, the guidelines which came up do not suggest to give us sustained inflation greater than five seconds uh, in a delivery room. So um, we cannot recommend this at the moment. What about the adrenal administration? These are very nice physiological uh, studies which have been done. And if you look at, uh, it is very beautifully highlighting the difference between a newborn and a postnatal uh, baby. Uh, and if you see in the newborn who's just born, if you give her ad uh, adrenaline through the uh, ET tube, it is the first dose will produce ROSC in 40% of the babies. But in the postnatal babies in the NICU, 50% will uh, get ROSC. Second dose will reduce 66% in the newborn and 83% in the postnatal. IV epinephrine after that would produce 100% ROSC in both of them. And also they looked into uh, the plasma epinephrine levels which were much low, lower in the newborn than the postnatal baby when they were given through the ET tube, even after the second dose of the epinephrine. Now, why this is there? The reason for this is very, very clear. We all know that newborn uh, lung is filled with water and there is compliance is very poor. So if you put an endotracheal uh, epinephrine, then you are, uh, uh, epinephrine is not going to be absorbed. And uh, because of this reason, also there is a low pulmonary blood flow which will limit the absorption. And hence, ET tube epinephrine is not going to be absorbed. There's a right to left trend which is going on, which is further impairing it. In a baby who's in the NICU, the lung is filled with air, compliance is much better, the pulmonary blood flow is much better, the PVR is quite low, and hence the endotracheal epinephrine absorption is going to be much better. Also, there is a problem with the dose. The earlier dose of 0.01 mg per kg with a lower flush produced ROSC in only 33% of the babies. The higher dose of 0.03 mg per kg with a higher flush produces ROSC in 100% of the babies. And also the time taken to get the ROSC is much lesser if you use a higher dose and higher flush as compared to low dose and the lower flush. Another one study which I just uh, want to share with you, which came in past and is not in the human beings, but in the lambs, which they were trying to give the uh, epinephrine directly into the uh, umbilical cord. So when the epinephrine is given directly into the umbilical cord and then milking was done, definitely the ROSC was much earlier than when you're catheterizing and then uh, putting, giving the epinephrine and it is taking time and hence the ROSC is late. So maybe in 2025, we will get this as a uh, new guideline, but at the moment it is not there. At the moment, the vascular access should be umbilical vein. And if it is not available, then you can use an introsious route. ET suction, meconium stain, amniotic fluid, uh, systematic review uh, for this, for babies who are less than, uh, more than 34 weeks, and uh, are coming out from the meconium stain amniotic fluid and are not vigorous. So suctioning and non-suctioning were uh, seen and they looked into survival to the hospital discharge plus the neurodevelopmental impairment and meconium aspiration syndromes. And when, uh, till 2015, two studies were there which uh, favored no suction. After that, there were more studies in added and it showed no difference between the two groups. And uh, this no difference was there for mortality and no difference was there for the need for resuscitation. Uh, 
after this uh, uh, guidelines were uh, imposed of uh, not suctioning into the uh, babies who were non vigorous uh, vermont expert network took out the data and they found that uh, if you compare from 2015 before 2015 and after 2015 there were more babies who required nitric oxide and there were more babies who were having hiv so they were actually questioning of this uh, uh, non suctioning uh, thing however uh the systematic review which came up which i just shared did show uh no difference in survival to discharge in meconium aspiration syndrome between the two uh things so hence uh what il court says that we should be do, uh, suggesting against the routine immediate direct laryngoscopy after delivery with or without tracheal suctioning and this meconium aspirator should be out of the delivery room then the lung protective strategies has also come that you should be gentle during the delivery room itself gentle in ventilation gentle in oxygenation and you may also come up with volume guarantee ventilation there cardio pulmonary interaction is to be seen and uh, if you are intubating you should actually try to extubate these baby as early as possible then the new thing which has come is skin to skin care where they said very clearly if a healthy newborn baby who is not requiring any active resuscitation that baby can be placed directly skin to skin on mother that is kangaroo mother care can be done and this will actually help to improve temperature control glucose stability and breastfeeding then about the duration of intensive resuscitation so they looked into uh babies uh who were given resuscitation for 10 minutes compared to babies who were given resuscitation beyond 10 minutes and they compared and looked at cardio pulmonary resuscitation uh discontinued at 10 minutes and outcomes were survival to any age long term neurodevelopmental outcome composite of survival to any age without moderate or severe neuro disability and uh, there were five uh observational studies um in 2015 uh, two population studies came up 16 eligible studies with 579 newborns infants were there and uh, what did they find found was there was no difference between the two uh in survival without moderate to severe impairment no difference in survival without moderate to severe impairment and deaths so what they said was that if you will continue the resuscitation for 10 to 20 minutes there is no evidence that any specific duration of resuscitation would predict mortality or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment so you can continue reasonably for 20 minutes after birth to uh, have a give a chance for the baby to survive and hence when you achieve 20 minutes of proper resuscitation you will talk to your healthcare team you will talk to the family members and then discuss to withhold the resuscitation efforts to so summarize ventilation of the lung is the key to neonatal resuscitation increasing heart rate is the most important sign of effective resuscitation avoid cord milking in extremely preterm infants 21% oxygen may not be adequate for extreme preterm so 30% is to be started epinephrine should be avoided to be given through endotracheal tube higher dose and higher flush should be used with in the uvc you should always try to use two thumb technique for the uh, cpr put the pulse oximeter and ecg monitor if more resuscitation is required and mr sopa should be done use of peep should be done and epinephrine as i said iv route should be preferred the other emphasis which is given is to the team work preparation before resuscitation is important structured check of equipment and supply should be done we must identify the role and documentation should be very very important so every birth as i said should be attended by one person and that if that person is assigned he should be actually uh, looking at the risk factor and if more people are required he should ask for those he should be doing the checklist uh, uh, check and if a high risk birth is going to happen he should anticipate and call and assign roles 
So team briefing is important. Determine who is going to be the team leader, who is going to be checking the checklist, who is going to be uh, doing what task. This is very important. And our talk to the OV provider is important for the delayed cord clamping as well. So we must know who all are the high risk deliveries so that all everyone should know which one we will call for more people. The checklist should be uh, written for bomb, for clear airway, auscultation, ventilation, oxygen, intubation, medication, and should be ticked. And assigning role is important that the main leader will be on the head end and will be looking for the uh, positioning of the head, putting the cap, opening the airway, ventilating and intubating. The second resuscitator would be standing on this side, drying, stimulating, placing the pulse oximeter, assessing the heart rate and breathing and if required doing the chest compression. Assistant will be signing on the other side to start the timer, to put the ECG, to help in suction, to adjust the thermal mattress, prepare the medication and taking the notes. So as we said, we are, uh, uh, the fourth question is the uh, um, cord uh, management. Antiretal counseling, team briefing, equipment check is to be done. done. So uh, the order is different. Like from 2015, it was warm, position, head and neck, suction if needed, dry or cover in plastic and stimulate. And now we have warm, dry, stimulate, position head and neck and suction if needed. So this change you should know, these are the change from 2015 to 20. And hence, if the baby is happening gasping, what to be done, then you have to uh, do further. If not, then you have to stay to uh, take to the mom side and you have to monitor the temperature and still look at the airway and clearing the secretions if required. So if the baby is happening or gasping or heart rate is below 100, then you do to give positive pressure ventilation, saturation monitor, ECG to be done. If not, then you have to look at if the baby is having labored breathing or persistent sinuses. Then you need to position and clear the airway, put a saturation monitor with oxygen or consider CPAP and post resuscitation care to be done. If the heart rate still remains below 100, then what we need to do? Then we need to ensure adequate ventilation here is the time when you can consider intubation or use an LMA and you have to put a cardiac monitor. If heart rate remains still less than 60, then you have to start the chest compression and this is the time when you have to give 100% oxygen. If heart rate still remains below 60 and you are sure that you have done MR SOPA and everything is going on fine, then you have to consider giving IV epinephrine every three to five minutes. And if heart rate still remains less than 60, then you have to look for hypovolemia, Look for pneumothorax, gives a line if required. And this saturation target should be beside you to uh, titrate your oxygenation. This is uh, including everything. Cleaning airway is important that uh, the difference is that uh, tactile stimulation and clearing the airway in newly born uh, is said that if the baby is crying of his own, do not routinely uh, suction the airway, not required. However, if the baby is uh, uh, showing that he is ineffective respiratory after, after birth, then you should do a tactile stimulation. And if you need to have, if you, you see pool of secretion, then you should do suction. Or if you are considering positive pressure ventilation and airway looks obstructed, then you should do the suction. Meconium, we already talked that we should not be doing any kind of a um, you know, intubation and suctioning uh, to a non vigorous baby until unless it is obstructing our airway. Heart rate, we said we are going to uh, use a pulse oximeter and ECG in case we are uh, going to go for a further uh, management. So whenever you are thinking that you are going to go for a positive pressure ventilation, you should have a cardiac monitor preferably and uh, Especially if you want to uh, intubate the baby, you should have an ECG monitor there. And uh, starting uh, for preterm baby at 30 and for a term baby at 21 and keep looking at the um, saturation and keep changing your FiO2s accordingly. 
So this we talked about. And if the baby is having a labored breathing, you should think of giving CPAP uh, to this baby and start the peep of five. Or if you're using uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation, you should have something with the peep and the pip. And so if any baby who is requiring positive pressure ventilation, you should give a pip of 20 to 25, a peep of five, and uh, you should uh, have a heart rate monitoring uh, going on. And um, in case you are want to, uh, the, uh, the, rest, the rate which you want to give is 40 to 60, and the inspiratory time which you will choose should be less than one. And if it is a preterm infant, don't use the sustained inflation, which cause its baby harmful. So uh, TP's resuscitator should be used and you should, can use two hand technique with jaw thrust and uh, it will give us a very, very uh, good and uh, very controlled uh, pressures to be delivered. Now, how we do assess the steps? First assessment, heart rate after 15 seconds of positive pressure ventilation. If you heart rate is increasing, announce heart rate is increasing and you continue the positive pressure ventilation. And after 15 seconds, you should assess the heart rate again. If not increasing, chest is moving, then you will announce heart rate is not increasing, but chest is moving. That means continue the positive pressure ventilation, assess after 15 seconds again. If not increasing and chest is not moving, you will announce heart rate is not improving, chest is not moving. That means you need to do a corrective measure, either do MR SOPA or you intubate or you use LMA and see if the chest movement is happening or not. And if your chest movement is happening, then continue and reassess the heart rate after 30 seconds. So MR SOPA is mask adjustment, reposition, airway. Try positive pressure ventilation and chest, reassess the chest uh, movement. You can reapply the mask and consider two hand technique. Keep the head neutral or slightly ex extended. S is suction mouth and nose, which uh, open mouth is open the mouth and lift the jaw forward and try positive pressure ventilation and after you that reassess the chest movement. If it's still not happening, then that means you need to increase the pressure and you can increase the pressure five to 10 centimeter increment and maximum you can go is 40. And again, after increasing pressure, you try positive pressure ventilation and reassess the chest movements. If still not happening, then you have to try for an alternate airway that is you need to intubate or you put an element. And you have to check the heart rate after 30 seconds. Second assessment, heart rate after 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and uh, at least 100 beats per minute, continue positive pressure ventilation 40 to 60. But if it is 60 to 90, you have to reassess ventilation, ventilate corrective steps if necessary. If less than 60, then you should look at your ventilation. Ventilation corrective steps are necessary or you insert an alternate airway, if no improvement, 100% oxygen and chest compression should be done. Chest compression, as we said, to be done when heart rate is less than 60 and you have done adequate ventilation for at least 30 seconds, and then you do a chest compression. Two thumb technique is to be used, and uh, three is to one ratio is to be used. And then if not uh, okay, you have to use intravascular access to give adrenaline umbilical vein is to be used for that. And medication used, as I said, high dose of adrenaline with a high flush you should be using. If you cannot put uh, uh, umbilical line, one dose of AT and uh, adrenaline can be given. And after the two, three adrenaline and chest compression, if baby is still not getting better, then it may be reasonable for us to uh, give a saline, especially if we know that heart rate is less than 60, in spite of our all efforts and uh, what we can give is normal saline, but we should give it slowly over 20 minutes. And then is the post resuscitation care where we have to take these babies to our uh, um, uh, NICU, where if the baby is more than 35 weeks, you will think of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and you will think of uh, starting a hypothermia treatment in your unit and uh, giving, looking at the temperature, looking at the sugar, looking at the ventilation, all these things should be done in your NICU. And um, as we said, ethics and end of life, 20 minutes should be given. You should look for uh, chromosomal anomalies which are not compatible with life 
and uh, those are the babies where you can stop doing our resuscitation. Training is important and briefing is important as we already told and uh, we already talked about it. And then my last slide is uh, from Satyam. This is uh, in brief of whatever we have talked about that the four pre-brief questions are gestational age, amniotic fluid clear or not, additional risk factors, umbilical cord management, are you ready or not? Then initial steps, warm, dry, stimulate, position, airway, suction if needed. These are the ways the steps are. And when an alternative airway becomes necessary, a cardiac monitor should be put to uh, have an accurate heart rate assessment. The suggested endotracheal epinephrine dose while establishing a vascular excess is 0.1 mg per kg equal to 1 ml per kg or 0.1 mg per ml of preparation. Initial IV or introsious epinephrine is quite higher and with a higher flush and 3 ml flush should be done so that uh, you get an early loss. And if confirmed absence of heart rate following 20 minutes, then you can stop by after talking to the parents. The near research future is large trial should be done on ED suction in non vigorous neonates born through MSF. Epinephrine in the neonatal resuscitation in different ways is to be again seen. Volume resuscitation in delivery room is also another research question. And volume ventilation in delivery room is another research question. Thank you for uh, your time. And um, we are uh, ready for more questions.